We welcome all of you to Christ Alone Lutheran Church here in Thienesville and Mequon, Wisconsin. We're so glad you take the opportunity to join us as we gather together to worship our living Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our worship opens with the singing of our first hymn, I Walk in Danger All the Way. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Let us pray. Dear Jesus, ruler of wind and wave, we want to trust you in all things, but in sinful weakness, our faith often fails. Send your Holy Spirit this day to grip our hearts with confidence and trust by the power of your word. He who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now invite you to join with us as we sing Psalm 73. Our epistle lesson for this day is recorded for us in the book of James, chapter 1, select verses. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. This is the word of our God. We hear now the verse of the day. Our gospel reading is recorded for us in the Gospel of Matthew, 
chapter 14. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking in the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sing, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Our worship now continues with a selection by Koine, By grace I am saved.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. My wife and I got into a debate about telling ghost stories around the campfire to little children. I'm not going to tell you who was on which side of the debate. Is it a good thing to intentionally let someone get scared, or isn't it? That brings up an important Bible question, a question of faith. In today's Old Testament reading, the children of Israel are pressed up against the edge of the Red Sea by the immense army of Pharaoh and his chariots. They were terrified and reacted badly. They were sure that they were going to die. So let me ask you a question. Was that a good place to be or a bad place? Was God right in letting them get so scared or was he being cruel to them? I hope in the next few minutes you'll come to a firm answer and one that means everything when God chooses to lead you to a point of fear and faith on the edge of the sea. That's what we're calling today's message. Let me crystallize what happens when I suggest that God's people are allowed to fear, urged to hear, brought into the clear, and stirred to revere. I'm guessing that most who are listening to this recording know something about the history leading up to this breathtaking account by the Red Sea. Read the opening chapters of Moses' book of Exodus for a refresher. God had just delivered Israel from almost 400 years of bondage as slaves in Egypt, using 10 powerful plagues of destruction. Most Egyptians by this time were saying, good riddance, leave our country before we're destroyed. They even loaded down the people with riches to get rid of them. But stubborn Pharaoh, whose heart God had hardened in judgment, foolishly decided to go after them as they headed east toward the Red Sea en route to the desert of Sinai. So he gathered his war chariots and soldiers and took off after them, finally cornering them on the edge of the sea. Listen as the account begins. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us up to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. The sight of Pharaoh's armies with their spears and 600 chariots gleaming in the desert sun, the sounds of horse hooves pounding down upon them would have worked terror in the hearts of the bravest soldier. But these were families with mothers and children and old men and women and their herds. What chance of survival would they possibly have if they opposed this mighty king, they thought? And in their minds, what right did Moses have to put them into a situation like this? We told you, Moses, they said, we were willing to continue to be slaves rather than to be put into jeopardy like this. Except, this was God's idea. Remember how he had called Moses in the burning bush to deliver his people? And remember how he had promised to be with his servant to bring this about? Let's remind ourselves of something very important here. God could have delivered them long before this by totally wiping out the strength of Egypt. Isn't it interesting that he didn't? An explosion far bigger than you witnessed on YouTube in Beirut could have wiped out this heathen nation from its capital city. But God had a divine agenda that included this group of people at this time and place. Remember that God had said to to Moses, The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Never forget that our God is interested in having people notice him and take him seriously so that they might be saved. And he chooses at times to push his people to the edge of the sea, allowing them to taste a bit of terror in the process. He is about to work the astounding miracle of creating faith. Have you considered that in order to work unshakable faith in your heart, 
God may need to back you up to your own Red Sea, where the chariots of death are facing you, and the spears of terror are threatening you. You will know better than anyone what is making you afraid. Can you think of that fear for a moment? And can you accept the truth that in God's hands, fear on the edge of your own personal Red Sea is exactly what you need? Should we look at the next 12 months and think, I wonder what fear God in his love will allow me to experience because he loves me and is building my faith. On the edge of the sea, you are allowed by God himself to fear. And then you are urged to hear God's promise of deliverance and believe it. The account continues. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Do not be afraid. How often we hear God saying that to people in the scriptures. You will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Hey, you scared people, wait till you see what God does. Then come those thrilling words, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. God will do the work. Your only job is to be still. Like a little baby whose mother says, shh, it's okay, be quiet. Stop your crying. Let God be God. Trust him. Have you noticed that it's when people are terrified that they are most open to hearing the words of those who bring comfort? When life is easy, who needs God? It's when the bombs are going off or the engines on the plane are failing or the waves are sinking the boat that we cry, Lord, save us, we perish. And it's at that moment when the still, small voice of God saying, Shh, my child, it's all right. I am big enough and powerful enough to save you. Someone wrote the following prayer illustrating the heart God is looking for as he urges us to hear his comfort. God, grant me to be silent before you that I may hear you, at rest in you that you may work in me, open to you that you may enter, empty before you that you may fill me, let me be still and know you are my God. Amen. As God works faith in our hearts, we are allowed to fear and urged to hear. Then God does his thing. And this is the third point. People are brought into the clear. Moses relates the stunning events at the Red Sea as they unfold. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. This account is brought up multiple times in the literature of Israel for its fantastic power and goosebump-raising excitement. Moses reminded the people of this 40 years later, as did Joshua. Nehemiah included it in his prayer to the Lord. A half dozen psalms recount recount the event. Um, Isaiah reminded Israel. Stephen testified to it at his stoning. St. Paul reminded his readers of it, and the writer to the Hebrews included it in that great chapter of faith. That God should make water behave so unwater-like and stand up like a wall and allow the people to walk through the seabed on dry land is absolutely spellbinding. Even though there are many examples of God's deliverance in the history of Israel, this one is held up as the premier example of God's saving power. 400 years of slavery is brought to a stunning end. The Egyptians were utterly destroyed. God crushed them with his mighty right hand. His chosen people are free to live. In Psalm 77, God provides us with a deep insight into his plan for saving his chosen ones. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. Do you treasure that truth? God did not let his people see his footprints or understand his paths to deliverance. He surprised the Israelites in their weakness of faith. Neither will he let you see the future or connect all the dots in his divine plans for your life. All you may see is the water before and the soldiers behind as you face your calamity of heart or body, of property or income. But the Lord your Savior walks before you promising, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. And yet, this is not even the greatest act of deliverance in the Bible. It pointed ahead to the far greater salvation that this God of Israel would perform 1,400 years later, where the enemy was not Pharaoh, but Satan where the assault was not with spears and chariots, but with temptation and lie, where the result was not just a piercing of the body and its physical death, but the eternal death of the soul in hell. Jesus would provide far more than a safe way through water. By his hand-to-hand combat with Satan, he would take his stand against our worst enemy and lay down his life as our sacrifice for sin. In baptism, he would provide a way through water and word to the promised land of heaven where we will live forever. In the words of one hymn, all who believe and are baptized shall see the Lord's salvation. Baptized into the death of Christ, they are a new creation. Through Christ's redemption, they shall stand among the glorious heavenly band of every tribe and nation. Allowed to fear urged to hear, brought into the clear. Israel was given her final blessing that day. She was stirred to revere. The account concludes this way. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry land, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Seeing the water collapse on their enemies, watching as the bodies of the powerful enemy soldiers and their horses washed up on the shore, we're told the Israelites feared the Lord. What this means is that they reverenced him as God and Savior and trusted him and his servant. It's another way of saying, all right, Lord, we trust you. We honor you. We praise you as God and no other. We need never be afraid. It took a few moments of fear 
to get that blessed point of faith. Really, that's where we should all crave to be. One sainted author, Herman Gockel, illustrated the blessing of faith with his own little story. A traveler in the middle of a cold winter day came across a snow-covered river. Now, frozen rivers can be notoriously dangerous places to walk, but he had to cross, and the light was fading. So the man got down on all fours, crawling fearfully inches at a time across this river. Suddenly, he heard a sound in the distance of a jolly man singing as he drove a sleigh drawn by a team of horses out onto the ice with no hesitation across the water, up to the far river bank, and off down the road. Which of those two men would you like to be? The one crawling on the ice full of fear, or the one who had boldly learned that the ice would hold him? There is no greater gift that God could give his people this side of heaven than to be stirred to revere your God. He may give you a dependable job and steady income, a comfortable house and plenty of food and clothing, He may bless you with a loving family and faithful friends and many years on earth to enjoy them. But to give you a God-fearing heart through Jesus Christ, confidence when you're backed up against the sea, faith in the face of danger, respect for the Father who loves you, and a joyful outlook on the future. That's the stuff dreams are made of. And that's the dream that you have fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So go ahead. Let him bring you to the edge of your personal sea. In his hands, that's a great place to be. Amen. After the Lord performed this tremendous miracle of deliverance for Moses and the people of Israel, the prophet Moses burst forth into a beautiful song in Exodus chapter 15. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my song. Let's join in singing that. confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray. 
Father, you know that the world is in constant turmoil like an angry sea. We are helpless against the storms that rage around us. We have no answer for the tumult of trouble. We can't stop the churning. The waves of fury threaten to sweep us away until we are no more. But you have promised to be our rock of refuge. You have promised to be our safe haven from the storm, our shelter from the wind and strife. You have said, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. You have told us that our strength lies in quietness and trust in you. No matter how many troubles and dangers swirl around us, help us to trust your promise that you are still in control and that you will help and protect us. We ask you to hear us, O Lord, and also hear us when we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go now in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. We are so glad you were able to join with us in worship this day. We pray that you were edified by the word of God and comforted to know that our Lord and Savior is Lord over all. May the Lord richly bless you in the week ahead with good health, and please join with us again next week. We also want you to know that we truly appreciate your gifts and responses to our programming. May the Lord richly bless all of you. <laughs>